Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone who is joining us today. My name is Katerina Rostova and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Bonavere Institute of Human Rights. And it is a great pleasure and indeed an honor for me to welcome you to this launch of the book, Human Rights Litigation Against Multinational in Practice. We are collaborating today with Lee Day. Lee Day is a leading human rights and personal injury firm based in London, and the Bonavere Institute of Human Rights is a dedicated research institute within the Faculty of Law at the University of Oxford. Next to me is Richard Mirren, a partner and head of the international department at Lee Day. Richard is a creative mind and the editor of the book that we are celebrating today. Congratulations again, Richard, and all the authors for this important publication. And thank you for inviting the Institute to be part of this event. The book provides a thorough review of transnational human rights litigation commenced by victims of business-related human rights abuses and features chapters from eight jurisdictions. This topic has attracted significant attention from academic civil societies and lawyers over the last decades. But the value of this book in particular is that it is written by highly experienced lawyers who have run many of the key groundbreaking cases and who understand the opportunities and hardest that arise in practice. And this is why it's certainly a unique collection on the market. But the book also raises many important debates at the core of scholarly analysis. What is the role of domestic courts in fostering human rights accountability? And what is an effective remedy? We are grateful to the publisher, Oxford University Press, for providing a discount code for ordering the books, and my colleagues will share it in the chat shortly. Our event today will proceed as a roundtable discussion with the contributors, and I will introduce them now in order their chapters appearing in the book. We are lucky to have with us today Robert McCorkadale, Professor of International Law and Human Rights at the University of Nottingham, Barrister and mediator at Greek Court Chambers in London and founder of Inclusive Law. Daniel Leader, partner at Lide. Zanelle Mbuisa, director at Mbuisa Molilia Tornis in South Africa. Jason Brickhill, tutor at Faculty of Law, the University of Oxford, where he has recently submitted his PhD. Jason is also an advocate at Johannesburg Bar and honorary research associate at the University of Cape Town. Bruce Johnston, founding partner of Trudel. Johnston and Les Browns in Quebec, Paul Hoffman, partner at Sean Braun, Settler, Harris, Hoffman, and Zeldis in USA, Chana Zamkalden, partner at Kraken de Oliveira Human Rights Lawyers in the Netherlands, Ray Lindsay, partner and co head of Public International Law, ES Julius, and Business and Human Rights Practices at Clifford Chance in the UK, Susan Dunn, founder of Harbour Litigation Fund in the UK, Anita Ramasastri, professor of law at the US. The University of Washington and Vice Chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. We will be also joined later by Miriam Sajmas, and we have received apologies from the Australian and French authors who unfortunately can't be here with us today. Before we start our discussion, I just want to thank both teams at Lee Day and the Bonavere Institute for working hard over the last few weeks in putting this event together and running the webinar behind this screen. And we are ready to start the discussion. And my first question goes to Anita. Anita, you wrote the foreword to the book, so you will also start our discussion today. So the question for you is, what role has transnational human rights litigation played in plugging the accountability gap in business and human rights field? And has litigation made businesses take their human rights responsibilities more seriously? And would you regard the expansion of such litigation more global as beneficial? Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. And I'll actually start with an anecdote. Um, I met Richard Mirren many, many years ago uh, at a conference uh, in the Netherlands focusing on how we could use tools like litigation to deal with corporate accountability transnationally. And it was wonderful to meet him. And, and I was a young scholar also beginning my career focusing on this. And then the next time I met him was, was soon thereafter in, in London on a city street and he was hopping in a taxi to go celebrate because the House of Lords had just handed down the decision in the, in the Cape case, uh, which was a seminal and still a groundbreaking case. So uh, just to say that, that th these victories uh, have been slow but steady over several decades. And, and so it's really a tribute to Richard and to everyone who is part of this book that you have such a great breadth of expertise uh, contributing to this volume and this knowledge and hoping to spur on the next generation of lawyers. But the challenge, my answer as an academic is I get to sort of say yes and no, but the, the yes piece is that civil litigation is the one tool that's in the hands of rights holders, right? That victims and their lawyers 
have the ability to actually knock on a corporation's door and to pursue them for corporate related human rights abuses. And so this is something that is a key tool. And as the working group has said in its own work on remedy and access to remedy, that we need all roads to remedy. So we need civil litigation. And I would re really hate to see what would happen if we foreclose this even more. So without it, it's sort of a necessary ingredient um, of corporate accountability. That's my larger message. But I think as we're gonna hear from the authors today, we see glimmers of hope and, and novel developments in a variety of jurisdictions, whether it's France or the UK or Canada. We see other jurisdictions like the US retreating with the alien tort statute. All of this is interesting and important, but I think the largest issue after 10 years of the UN guiding principles and longer with human rights litigation is how much have we been able to deliver justice to, to, to victims and rights holders? That's the larger issue. But without civil litigation, we'd be delivering no justice at all. So that's my, I think my larger answer. But we also need other uh, mechanisms. And this is where I would focus, for example, on the fact that we also need states to step up and when there are grave human rights abuses, pursue criminal remedy. And we're starting again to see some of that and a movement in that direction. We're supposed to have strong non-judicial mechanisms, but again, we've seen that those have fallen short. So civil litigation is our best hope at the moment and our strongest tool, even if we have a large challenge. Anita, it's really good to see you here today. And uh, it's nice to remember being young as well. I <laughs> vaguely remember it myself. Uh, if I could just ask you a quick follow-up question. Um, uh, you, you said that um, civil litigation is, is, is certainly not the be-all and end-all, but an important contributor. What about a, a legally binding treaty? Uh, or is, that, uh, is that coming? Is it inevitable? Is it necessary? What would you say about that? I think it's ideal, and I would say necessary. Um, the question is when and how we get there. Um, I'm a scholar in two fields. The other is in anti-corruption. And we saw sort of a movement from one, one state acting with a statute that had extraterritorial effect through to regional conventions and finally to a United Nations global consensus. In business and human rights, we've kind of fast forwarded from sort of uh, the guiding principles to a negotiation of a legally binding instrument. The question is, will that work? And, and, and it's an open question. So um, what, I, what the working group has said and what we strongly support is that voluntary has not worked. We support binding and maybe it will be a globally uh, agreed upon treaty. But if for some reason we don't achieve consensus there, I do think that there are ways to look at regional options as well. So we have now the EU looking at mandatory human rights due diligence, which we hope will have a civil liability component. But I would hope that we would see other regions and you know, we can't underestimate regional entities and the OECD, of course, for capital exporting nations has a strong role to play if states would actually get together there uh, and choose to, uh, to negotiate a convention. If I could just bring in Ray. Ray, are you there, Ray Lindsay? Uh, I can't see you on the screen, but I think, I think you are there. Uh, I am here. Yeah. Um, uh, Anita said that voluntary principles are not enough. I just, just to say, to, First of all, that um, I'm, I'm really pleased that you've contributed to this book. Your contribution is unique, and I think you're very brave to have contributed uh, when everyone else who's contributed is a claimant's lawyer, uh, which is why I gave you 50% uh, more, more, um, uh, more space than everyone else, actually. But um, it's an excellent chapter that you've written. Um, and you've and you've written uh, the business perspective. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, in terms of uh, deterrence, uh, you are presumably advising corporate lawyers regularly about uh, the impact of litigation and to ensure that their practices are up to scratch, uh, so that um, they can avoid being sued. What's your view of the effect of litigation? Do you agree that the threat of litigation serves as an important preventative deterrent against corporate human rights abuse? Um, I'm going to take the Anita route when, when it comes to the question and, and say probably a bit, bit of yes and, and a bit of no. But before we start, I mean, first of all, congratulations, Richard, on um, 
compiling the book, bringing these excellent chapters together and all the other authors for their contributions. And I do feel, I did walk into this with a little bit of trepidation, was I, you know, coming into the jaws of the wolves, um, but thank you. And, and I was asked to give a, the business, the business perspective. There is no such thing, obviously, and every, everything that I say is, you know, just my perceptions from having worked in this area for a couple of decades also, um, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be part of the discussion. Um, I think, you know, Anita was spot on in what she said, which is unfortunately changing this. Litigation is obviously always going to be an important feature in this space um, and, and has to be there for, you know, really serious cases. I think part of the difficulty for business to come to to terms with is that it's often uh, fortuitous you know which which companies are on the end of litigation it depends on where they're incorporated whether that is a relatively friendly forum and what the litigation models are there so query whether it's the best route to accountability for the worst forms of human rights abuse that might be associated with businesses um, and in that sense you know often businesses are, in, are, are on the firing line not because they're the, the prim primary causal actors in a particular event or occurrence that has given rise to harms but they are involved in some secondary capacity so you know there is the sense that it's it's a blunt tool sometimes to get to actually the the nitty-gritty of, of of where the you know dealing with impunity for human rights abuse per se um, and what's the role but obviously you know what's the role of multinationals and all of that and clearly you know as a deterrence i think the fact of litigation um is, is always a wake-up call for people but the prospects of liability at the end are still quite slim as, as anita just identified um, and, and that's one of the difficulties here is, is the litigation process um, is, is not an attractive one for businesses, but it's also not an attractive one for claimants. Um, and so, you know, the, there is this, um, my, you know, my sense is that litigation is often a very blunt and inappropriate tool. As Anita has said, it, sometimes it might be the only option, but it doesn't necessarily save claimants well in many contexts. And, uh, you know, I quote Helen Duffy in, in my chapter in the book, who says that litigation rare, rarely resolves human rights problems and so from my perspective you know working with 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 uh, you know corporations they're not sitting thinking how how do i do the minimum you know to avoid litigation um they they recognize you know bad things happen to good companies um working hard to do things like implement the guiding principles and obviously be compliant with laws and what you know, Anita said is is also important is where are states in actually creating the frameworks within which you know it, entities can actually be be held to account um so um you know i i, I think that as i say it's it's I, I think one of the features of the last 10 years also is is there was always a polarized debate in in this space and i don't think we've actually come together enough in terms of lawyers across the claimant and the defendant divide to actually see what other routes there might be forward i think there are elements of that in some of the work that's going on some of the authors here um but it's, it's something that we should all work much harder on in the interests of all of our clients on both sides of the spectrum thank you thank you anita back to you and the question about the audience of the book do you feel that it is a valuable resource for ngos human rights defenders and businesses Yes, I do. I think, again, both a comparative perspective, so looking at the strengths and weaknesses of different jurisdictions, but I think, again, understanding the trajectory of these different cases in these different countries um, is really important as a collective body of work. So for researchers and, 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 and policymakers, definitely very important, but, but for litigators as well. And what we need to remember is, I mean, this is sort of an all-star lineup of people who've been working in the trenches for a long time to be pioneers in business and human rights or corporate accountability litigation. But for others who have yet to take up these cases, they need to know it's possible and they need to know where there might be mentors and leaders that can be allies as they think about this in their own jurisdictions. Thank you. I have a few questions for you, Richard. You won't be surprised about that. Can you tell us a little bit what was the idea behind the book? And was it easy to produce the book while also running a very busy practice, which as you know, <laughs> Well, well, the idea behind the book really was to give the practitioners perspective, and you can see from, from the lineup that we've got here, as Anita uh, mentioned, that um, we have a lot of the lawyers who've done most of the cases in, in this area uh, here and who've contributed. And you know, quite a lot has been written about the legal issues that arise in these cases, and that's obviously, uh, and how to interpret judgments and so on, is, is, is obviously very important. But 
you know, whilst identifying a viable cause of action is, is obviously essential, there are lots of other factors that uh, that determine whether or not uh, a remedy is available in practice for a victim and whether a, a company is held to account legally. So issues around uh, th uh, things like funding of, of, of cases, whether there's a funding system available so that people can obtain legal representation, which is so essential. Mechanisms for disclosure of internal documents, class action uh, procedures and so on. So that, that, those are the kinds of factors that, that, that these contributors are acutely aware of and are, are able to comment on from, um, from you know, first -hand, their first-hand knowledge and experience. As for producing the book, no, I mean, you know, for everyone who is doing uh, lots of work on other cases, this is, is, is a pretty difficult challenge. And it was a difficult challenge for me to try and get everyone to produce things with any, within any kind of reasonable time frame. Um, I, try, I tried to guilt trip them quite often by, by uh, telling them that everyone else had, had, uh, had produced their contribution. Uh, in the hope that they would, would produce theirs, but um, I think some of them probably were talking to each other and, and found out the, the trick. But um, no, I mean it, it was obviously a, a, a challenging task for everyone, I think, to to combine this kind of exercise with a busy busy practice. Okay, I can see the messages that there is a bit of an issue with the sound. We are trying to solve it, but meanwhile we try to talk a bit louder. So our colleagues are trying to resolve it. Sorry about that. Uh, my next question again for you, Richard. You run the first three current company cases, which began in the mid 90s, and that was Connolly versus Rio Tinto and cases against Cape PLC by asbestos miners. These were based on a total of duty of care, which you conceived of to overcome the corporate rail obstacle. How did these cases come about, and how they were first perceived by the judges and human rights community? Well, those uh, first three cases, in fact, that were in the 1990s were referred um, by trade unions, local trade unions uh, in South Africa and Namibia. And the problem was that the victims could not get access to justice in their local courts. So that wasn't an option. And we then had to consider whether there might be some route uh, to justice in the English courts, which meant looking at the parent company, which was the entity domiciled in England and over which the English courts would have jurisdiction. But that obviously immediately gave rise to the, the, the problem of the corporate veil and whether a, a, the basis on which a parent company could be held responsible, notwithstanding uh, that um, separation of corporate identity. But actually, um, as a tort lawyer, the, the notion that a parent company which was in control of or overseeing operations and was aware of risks, that that, that that parent company could be held to owe a legal duty of care and that liability could arise via that route wasn't really conceptually so difficult. Um, uh, I think for, for a commercial lawyer, um, there was a, a complete block, uh, but um, uh, you know, from from my perspective, that was a kind of a logical approach. Uh, well, the, the courts, of course, didn't necessarily see it that way at the beginning. And I can remember the first time we went to court, the judge asking, "What are all these South Africans doing suing in my court?" Uh, no judge would ever ask that now, but. Um, that was the, the, the environment then. And actually, even human rights organizations at that time didn't view these kinds of cases as human rights cases because they were based on allegations of negligence and they were cases against businesses, not against states. So, um, you know, it was, it was um, quite a difficult uh, beginning. Um, and, you know, there was a combination of I suppose um, creativity and, and strategic thinking and risk taking that has led to development of, of this area and um, choosing the right cases uh, and um, formulating courses of actions, getting over the forum 
non-convenience hurdle and so on. But there's also been a fair amount of luck, I would say, and you need a fair amount of luck in order to be able to, to succeed in a, in a new area. Um, the first three cases were funded by legal aid. We had a legal aid system then. We would never have been able, uh, as a small firm at that time, to have uh, funded that kind of case, but we had the benefit of, of legal aid to help with the financial burden. And we also, I think, have been lucky over the last 25 years to have judges who are quite open-minded and receptive to these types of cases and willing to, to develop the law in this area. So I think, you know, all those factors, a combination of uh, a fair amount of, of judgment and, and um, creativity, but also good fortune. Just to pick up then on this and summarise, so do you think this series of current company cases over 25 past years are an example of strategic litigation or it was largely the chance? Well, I, I think it's a combination of a combination of both, as I say. I mean, there certainly was a lot of strategic thinking that went into uh, the, the making sure that we, we, we did this using the right cases and, and the, the cause of action that was, um, that was uh, developed. Um, there was, for many years, we had to fight battles over forum non-convenience. And the Cape PLC case that Anita mentioned, a thousand of our clients died uh, during uh, the forum on convenience dispute. And fortunately, uh, in 2005, the ECJ effectively got rid of that, that hurdle for EU-based companies, but it, it, it's come back, um, come back uh, to us now in, in, in the past year because in the UK because of us, um, because of Brexit. But um, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of hurdles to overcome and a lot of um, strategic thinking that had to go into to, to running the cases. But, you know, as I said, at the same time, uh, a fair amount of luck because decisions could easily have gone the opposite way at, at any stage. Well, there has been certainly many progressive developments. And Dan, if we can stay a little bit on English jurisprudence, and the question is for you. So the English courts in a series of judgments have consistently expanded the scope of company liability going beyond formal control, and most notably in the Dunk and Hubby judgments that you were involved in. To what extent can the boundaries of English law be pushed further and cover supply chain liability? Um, thank you, Katia. Um, I think over the past four, four, five years, I would say, uh, multinational companies um, have had a concerted effort to engaging in a concerted effort to challenge parent company liability head on and to narrow its scope. And happily, that backfired spectacularly. Um, there were two cases that went up to the Supreme Court, Vedanta and Octavian Shell. And in both cases, the Supreme Court unanimously rejected the multinational company's attempt to limit parent company liability. And in fact, they ended up expanding the scope of parent company liability. So two points stand out. <clears throat> um, basically, in addition to liability arising from control and advice from parent companies, the Supreme Court said, actually, you could also get liability arising from multinational companies' global policy frameworks uh, if those policies are followed by subsidiaries, and it turns out that those are flawed. But secondly, and very importantly, the Supreme Court said that public commitments on supervision and control of subsidiaries can also give rise to liability if the company fails to honor those commitments. So those principles are so broadly stated that there's no reason why they couldn't be extended to supply chains. If a supplier is relying on advice or policies from the purchaser, or if the purchaser has made public commitments about the supervision and control of its supply chain, as frankly, most multinational companies are now doing, then there's no reason why the Vedanta analysis could not be applied in those circumstances. And in fact, this is being tested by a case which my colleague Martin Day is bringing and, and with, his, with another colleague, Ollie Holland, concerning child labor in Malawi, um, tobacco farms against British American tobacco. So we are seeing that the scope of civil litigation in this area 
uh, has broadened considerably following Medanta and Octavi. And I think we're going to see it tested rigorously in the years to come. There is the case of Begum and Moran, the shipbreaking case. I'm not sure if I have time to talk about that briefly. Richard, do you want to talk about that very, very briefly? So this was, again, a, a case brought by um, Martin Day and Ollie Holland, which concerned shipbreaking. This is the practice whereby shipping companies essentially sell off their ships to very unsafe um, shipyards in mostly in the Asian subcontinent, Bangladesh where and Pakistan, where they're broken up on beaches with no health and safety. Um, and it was held there by the Court of Appeal that it was arguable that ship owners were under a duty of care to ensure their ships should be are disposed of safely. So if they sell unsafe ships to notoriously unsafe shipyards, they could be held liable for the injuries of the workers who dismantled it. I just think for a moment how significant that is. The fact that an asset has been sold and a shipyard has nothing to do with the poor health and safety practices is deemed not to be a barrier to potential liability. And that has significant implications for asset disposal and decommissioning in high risk uh, injury industries. Multinationals can no longer wash their hands of human rights and environmental risks once they've sold an asset. And that's a very significant development as well. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, if I could just bring Robert from Corkadale in, just to step back for a moment, because um, you have, your chapter looks at um, uh, the, the patterns of litigation that have occurred in different uh, jurisdictions. And most of the discussion today uh, has been, uh, and is around civil claims. But of course, there are um, there is the possibility of criminal action today. Just today, for instance, there was an announcement that Swedish prosecutors have laid charges against directors of the Swedish company London Oil for complicity in war crimes in Sudan. So, I mean, perhaps you could just um, uh, uh, help us to identify what are the, the, the key differences between these two routes, both, both in terms of, of what um, needs to be proven, but also um, with regard to the outcome. Thanks, uh, Richard, and um, thank you for your book, and I'll hold it up because not enough people have probably got it yet in their hands, but excellent book. And I like the photo of people in the Vedanta case, actually um, uh, real live on the front. Um, so, uh, Richard, thank you for mentioning that case. I'm gonna start with a couple of other cases just to show where criminal law is going in this area. Um, you mentioned this case, as you say, which happened today. Well, there's also, of course, just a couple of months ago, uh, France's Cour de Cassion ruled that the French cement company Lafarge could be charged with complicity in crimes against humanity for their actions during the Syrian civil war, uh, in which they worked with and clearly paid armed groups to help the company operate. In addition, eight of the senior management of Lafarge, including the former CEO, are charged with financing a terror group and or endangering, endangering the lives of others. And that's on top of an earlier decision against a French surveillance company, uh, Amasis and Nexa, um, in, for complicity in torture in Libya and Egypt. So what we've got is this development of cases um, against MNCs and at an increasing rate. So what I wanted to do, I know our main focus is of course on um, civil cases, but these are really interesting to illustrate a few um, examples really of the difference or the similarity between criminal cases and civil ones. The first thing is all these criminal cases are in European civil law states. As so far, common law prosecutors have not been active in this area. Um, and that's quite an interesting comparison. And criminal cases, of course, require a higher level of proof than in the civil case, and also require a legal system which allows a higher level of proof, sorry, a higher level of um, kind of um, requirement, requirement that companies have um, a form of, of criminal liability, corporate criminal liability, including where the actions occurred in another state. So there's a range of different requirements. But there are positives 
A particular positive is a prosecutor can force a company to produce documents in a much stronger way than for a civil claim, as, as many of us know how hard it is to produce, get companies to produce those documents, understandably. At the same stage, the hope is that there's a fear by the senior management that Ray was talking about the consequences of these cases. Most people do not want to be brought before a court, and that's particularly the case for senior management of a company. But the consequence of that can be the prosecutor will have a lot of pressure on them not to bring this case, often because there's a company in a particular city and the local employees don't want it to occur, and the prosecutor probably doesn't have the actual knowledge to bring the case. There is one similarity, sadly enough, it takes a very long time. I mean, all these cases, the ones you mentioned, the two I talked about, um, have taken 10 years just to get to this stage of indictment. And of course, sadly enough, that's the same for civil cases. There's, there's a couple of other things I would like to mention. The first is, these cases are, of course, quite limited in terms of which human rights are going to be brought, because most human rights don't fall within the criminal uh, liability range. Um, and of course, similarly, of course, in civil claims, the human right has to be within a tort or other form of, of, of um, uh, action. But the other and the major main difference, in my view, is that the victims of the crime do not usually receive a remedy in a criminal case. Sometimes it's possible, as in France, or if the um, prosecutor asks the court for it, but otherwise, the main outcome is a very large fine to the company. Who, pay, who is that paid to? The state. And perhaps there's time in prison for the executives, which is pretty terrible for them, but no remedy to the victims. I want to just make one final point. I noticed Beth asked a question uh, in the questions and answers. But how can there be obligations of human rights on business when only states hold these obligations? These cases show that indeed companies do have human rights obligations. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Um, if I could just um, bring in Hannah uh, Sankalan. Hannah, I think you're there. Um, and just to kind of leaving, um, continuing uh, where Robert left off, in terms of corporate criminal liability, your chapter does uh, refer to um, the, the various uh, mechanisms that are available in the Netherlands. And I, I think you you specifically refer to the criminal action that was has been taken against ENI over activities in Nigeria and the criminal prosecution of, of Traffic Europe. But what I wanted to ask you about really was the work that the, the civil claims that you've done against Royal Dutch Shell, uh, where you have uh, you've triumphed, I think, recently in a, in a couple of very important cases uh, in the Netherlands. And um, now those cases, uh, interestingly, uh, because uh, we're dealing with Nigeria and the Rome II regulation, which applies across the European Union, uh, have been assessed uh, under English law. And um, so I just wanted, wanted to ask you about that, uh, about that experience of running a case under English law in the Dutch courts. Uh, you know, whether that was was easy in practice, um, how, how, how was it? Hmm. Um, yeah, thanks for that. No, I wouldn't say it was easy in practice, um, but that's maybe not a surprise. Um, I think cases like this, where you're really trying to, to expand on a certain legal concept, um, are already quite complicated by their very nature. Um, as Anita was also saying in her introduction, um, this is a very slow legal development, although we can say after you know all these years, it's a steady legal development, but still a complicated one. Um, and I guess it gets particularly complicated when you have to apply a system of law that's not your own. Um, so that was complicated for me as a lawyer, because when I started working on this case, I knew hardly anything about English law, um, common law systems. Um, and there I find myself juggling with English legal concepts like parent company liability and the judgments that I haven't been um, uh, trained to interpret, basically. Um, but it was also legally complicated, um, as expectedly, 
Shell's message to the court of The Hague was throughout the judgment, it's not your task as a Dutch court to further develop English law. So what you need to do is to apply these legal concepts that we see in, 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 in common law and English law in a very conservative way. Um, and um, so that was a, a complicated framework to work in because obviously had we applied Dutch law, it would have been much easier for us to try to get the court to um, adopt a sort of flexibility um, in its approach. Um, and for a long time, all we had in our case was the, the Cape uh, case that was already discussed as well. Um, the Okpabi case and the Vedanta cases started later. Um, and in part, these developed simultaneous to our case. Um, so that also meant that whether, you know, any development, positive or negative, could positively or negative our case as well. Um, and Shell certainly tried to use, for example, the, the Okpabi Court of Appeal judgment that was what they considered positive for them, of course, um, in that way. Um, but luckily, Vedanta came out just in time to underline everything that we had brought forward concerning parent company liability under English law. So it worked out well for us, but it was an exciting race there. Between yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it, the way that two, uh, two sets of cases in the Netherlands, the one with the, the case in the Netherlands that you were doing and the cases in England that Dan Leader was doing, were, were running in, in parallel and decisions, as you say, that fortunately ultimately went the right way for the claimants in the UK cases than helped your case. So that's, yeah. that's very interesting. And, and without giving anything away, because um, you obviously don't want to do that, um, was it possible for you and Dan to, to compare notes and, 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 and um, operate in a kind of mutually beneficial way as things went along? Um, yes, certainly. Well, to some extent, because obviously they're the boundaries of our professional um, obligations. Um, but definitely we made sure that we were well aware, of, well aware of what each of us was doing and um, how the case was developing and where we could, we exchanged information um, for the other to use. I mean, there was a, um, a risk there as well, of course, because the more you share the information, the more the cases are going to look alike. And then if there would have been a negative development in the UK and, and the case was brought in a very similar way, it was relying largely on the same kind of evidence that would increase our risks as well. Whereas if you have a set of you know, evidence that is um, uh, different from each other, at least you, as a lawyer, you have some more room to argue <laughs> that that should also lead to a different outcome of the case. Yeah, not, not a good idea necessarily to put all your eggs in the, in the same basket, I suppose. Um, can I just ask you about the, the Dutch system then? Uh, from uh, re, from um, your chapter, it, it's clear that um, the, the Dutch courts have quite a wide discretion to develop the law. But I just wanted to ask you about the, the, the practicality, some of the, the practical challenges, because there haven't been that many cases uh, in in the Netherlands, in the Dutch courts, um, you know, are there are there significant obstacles, practical obstacles to victims obtaining justice for, in this type of case in the Netherlands? For instance, around access to documents. Well, that was definitely the example that I was going to mention. Um, yes, and that was also one of the main complications in our case, at least in the first instance. Um, and it's a big difference uh, there between common law um, jurisdictions and a civil law jurisdiction as the Netherlands, that we do not have a face of discovery. Um, so the main principle in law is that the complainant must prove his or her case, um, but you do not automatically get access to documents that may be considered relevant for the other party. So what we needed to do in, in the Nigeria cases is well, to, to prove a certain level of control and of knowledge of the, the parent company. We were then focusing on um, the Chandler judgment, uh, the Cape judgment, I should say. Um, and, and in that judgment, um, Lady Justice Arden had this, um, identified circum circumstance, certain circumstances that led 
um, to liability, to parent company liability in that case. But obviously, that, that whole analysis was based on documents that had been obtained before and had been considered relevant for this situation. And the district court in the first instance in the Nigeria cases said, well, you have not been able to prove sufficiently that these circumstances also apply to Shell and you haven't been able to identify which specific documents Shell may have that could lead to further substantiation of your case. And therefore they denied us access to any of those internal Shell documents that would have um, given us more information about the way wherein this control and supervision um, process took place. So that was kind of a, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy basically, because there was no way out of this um, vicious circle. Um, and luckily the Court of Appeal took a different position later and ordered Shell to provide us um, the documents that we'd asked to see um, after all. And they did turn out to be extremely uh, helpful, but it remains one of the major complications, I believe in cases like this, and hopefully um, this will change in the future with a new approach to um, access to information, um, but that remains to be seen. And in fact, in one of our other cases, in the Kiobel case, we relied on the uh, Section 1782 in the US to obtain some of the documents that we needed in that case. Because this is what this is one of the reasons why people are calling for a reversal of the burden of proof. Because of the, the difficulties, especially in civil jurisdictions, civil law jurisdictions, of getting access to documents. So, Thanks for that, uh, Hannah. If I could just um, turn to Bruce Johnson. Bruce, um, in your chapter, uh, you say uh, that the issue of domestic liability for international human rights violations is particularly relevant in a Canadian context because Canadian corporations represent a disproportionately large share of the extractive sector worldwide. And of course, um, until recently, the, uh, these kinds of cases had been quite rare in the Canadian courts, but in the last few years, we've had the Hud Bay Minerals case, the Garcia and Tahoe case, and then, um, of course, the Nevson case, the landmark Supreme Court judgment in which you acted for Mining Watch Canada. So, I mean, perhaps you could just tell us, um, in, a, in, in summary, what what you feel are the, the key features of the Canadian system that make it favourable or unfavourable for multinational litigation? Well, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this, uh, in this uh, enterprise, which I think is extremely helpful uh, for anyone who's in practice to have access not only to uh, a summary of the applicable uh, rules in your own jurisdiction, but also access to the, uh, the rules for other jurisdictions to be able to compare is extremely helpful. And, uh, you know, if we'd had that 10 years ago, I think uh, many lawyers would have had uh, uh, really a leg up on the, uh, the issues. Uh, one, I think a good example of the progress that's been achieved in Canada is uh, uh, exemplified by an evolution in the uh, the conception of the courts of their own role. And uh, we worked on a case together, uh, Richard, uh, in Anvil Mining about 10 years ago, and um, we lost on jurisdiction. Um, and in the Court of Appeal of Quebec, uh, I remember arguing the case, and one of the judges on, on our case was uh, Richard Wagner, who is now Chief Justice of Canada. And I remember arguing uh, that it is the role of Canadian courts to, to hold accountable Canadian corporations who uh, engage in harmful conduct in, in jurisdictions where they will never be held liable. And I remember his nonverbal uh, reaction to our argument was just very negative. I, I, I said, we're gonna lose, you know, we, he, he is not with us. Uh, and Justice Wagner was then uh, uh, nominated to the Supreme Court and then became Chief Justice. And he was the deciding vote 
in uh, Nevsan. And we argued for Mining Watch as an intervener in uh, that case. And when we argued the case, we, we again brought, uh, you, know, you know, an intervener gets five minutes in the Supreme Court. And so the, the, the work was done by the plaintiff's lawyers, Camp Fiorente out of uh, Vancouver. But we use the five minutes to bring that issue back and say, you know, it is the role of Canadian courts. And uh, I think Nevsan is a case that everyone should read uh, because it, the, it contains uh, an articulation of that concept in, in a manner which I think is very persuasive, regardless of uh, which jurisdiction you're in. And one aspect that we used uh, successfully was to, to appeal to the civilians on the Supreme Court, because we, we, we said, you know, for any civilian uh, that is a civil law lawyer, uh, the, the concept that the norms uh, included in customary international law could be uh, norms of behavior that would, if violated, constitute a civil fault. There's nothing revolutionary or uh, even uh, uh, surprising in that concept. And, and we said, you know, for any civilian on the court, of which there are three, including Justice Vagna, um, the, the idea that a mature system of law uh, could not uh, find a way to articulate the, 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 the norms required to uh, adequately deal with the types of behavior, this was Nefson involved uh, forced labor in Eritrea, then it really leads one to question, you know, how is it that the, our system of law cannot account for this behavior? And civil law certainly could, and therefore common law should evolve. If it's not able to do it, then it should evolve. And uh, that's what the court said. Can I just pick up on the Nefson case and ask um, your question about it? There have, has been some commentary with this, uh, critiquing the judgment and saying that, you know, a corporation can be held liable for torts, for breaches of customary international law only in very limited circumstances. What's your opinion of this in general about linking private remedies to human rights violations? Well, it's it's a controversial, I mean, it's, it's uh, the, the court, uh, on a 5-4 basis and uh, found that it there was nothing um, preventing this evolution from occurring, but it's important to, to remember that there is not a decision on the merits uh, and there never there never will be in the Netsun case because shortly after the Supreme Court allowed the case to proceed, uh, it was settled. So uh, that's obviously a challenge which occurs frequently when you want to establish new uh, uh, new law. Um, but I think that the the language of the Supreme Court is so strong that uh, it will be certainly open to a lower court to establish uh, new torts um, based on the violation of customary international law and. And obviously, many of those norms apply only to countries or the behavior of countries, but uh, it, it is yet to be uh, fleshed out, in, and it, it'll take other cases. Uh, but certainly, I think what's most important is the court has signaled that, uh, yes, we do recognize in Canada that it is the role of Canadian courts to uh, hear cases of victims uh, harmed by Canadian corporations abroad. Oh, it's certainly an incredible judgment, Bruce. Um, and uh, hopefully there are other cases in, in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Well, there, yeah. there, <laughs> there, there are, um, and, and uh, we hope to be part of them. Very good, very good. Um, Robert, uh, just, to, just to bring you in uh, for a moment, I mean, do you think uh, I mean, this, this decision up in Nevson um, is, is, I think, Everyone felt it was a, a remarkable decision. Do you think there is a, a wider role for uh, international human rights law in multinational litigation? Perhaps not surprising, I'm going to say yes, of course. Um, and, and I think, in a way, what um, Bruce has just said about Nevson is an example. And, you know, I have found in my roles, as, similarly as an intervener, um, 
there are arguments you make about international human rights law before courts, but the courts don't often take them up in their decision. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily always a bad thing, because sometimes you raise comparative jurisprudence. This, these decisions are being made in different parts uh, of the world, and the court itself seems to ignore it in their decision. But I think by raising these comparative and international law issues for the courts, they're aware of these developments and often don't really want to be seen to be left behind. In fact, one of the judges in the Vedanta case specifically said, oh, this is clearly the direction in which the law is moving. Now, that doesn't always appear in the case decision, but it's definitely, I feel, in the judges' minds. And in fact, sometimes international human rights law can be influential, as seen in the decision by the Dutch court in Milieu de Foncy and Shell, um, in which, uh, about which Chenna spoke, in which the court did look at it. They, look, they mentioned expressly the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises to help the court determine that there was a duty of care by Shell not to contribute to human rights harm in terms of climate change. Now, okay, they didn't completely rely on it, but they have a significant discussion and consideration about those international human rights law um, developments. Um, and that's a really significant decision. And in fact, there's now a case before the German courts, DUH and Daimler, on a similar framework. And in some ways, this may answer uh, Anna's question about uh, climate change, which I feel is another area where there will be a development. And in fact, it's an important area because I think international human rights law can help sometimes for that kind of a case as a climate change case, because very, very hard to show a causal connection. But the contribution idea, which we find in international human rights law, could be helpful in this issue. But it's not always straightforward. And of course, the issue of identifying who the claimants are is not always straightforward. I would, I would just say one more thing, which is that um, sometimes ideas such as um, uh, contribution directly linked, et cetera, does end up coming in a way into the court's decisions, which I think um, can be very helpful in, in the way they're going to consider these things. Um, uh, though, of course, more work is needed on that front and more cases really for the courts to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for uh, mentioning the UN guiding principles. I just want to focus a bit on that. You know that, of course, you know, the UNGPs provide that businesses can be involved in human rights violations in a variety of ways, and they introduce these three concepts, uh, cause, contribute, and directly link to their views. How easily are these concepts translated into legal terms in different jurisdictions? Oh, very good question, really, Katja. I think that it's not always straightforward. I mean, using tort comparisons can definitely help. But it's you know, even human rights due diligence, one of the main terminologies in this area, is not easily moved across. Um, I mentioned, of course, this issue of contribution can be quite helpful um, as a means of offering a claim which is not just solely where you can make a direct link of, of cause. But I think some of the other aspects can be quite helpful. Um, one of the core aspects, as you know, is this idea of um, companies being directly linked to other companies for which they have responsibilities under international human rights law. And in doing that, um, the courts are not necessarily using that always directly, but indir indirectly in their consideration. So, for example, in the Okpapi and Shell case, the court clarified that it wasn't only about control which is needed by a parent company in relation to a subsidiary. It can be all other forms of um, uh, some form of directly being linked. And we have, of course, the, the French duty of vigilant case uh, law, which uh, gives a further clarification of, of that. So I think there's a way in which some of these ideas are seeping into the law, um, both at legislative and case law levels. And I think that will help in terms of either bolstering a particular argument made by a claimant, but also in terms of the court being able to see that there are different ways of analyzing issues 
not always within their current frame of reference of how to consider these matters. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. I'll just bring Paul Hoffman in at this stage. Um, Paul, uh, 20, 20 years ago, uh, litigation using the Alien Tort Statute was really regarded as, as providing the best potential route for multinational accountability. Uh, and you've been at the forefront of, of most of the cases um, that have been uh, have gone to the, the higher courts during that, that period. Um, and it's starting with, with Kierbel in 2013, uh, these cases have really suffered a, a series of, of setbacks. And most recently with the, the Doe and Nestle decision in the Supreme Court this year, what would you say is the future of alien tort statute litigation in the US schools? Has it got a future? Uh, that's a big question. Um, we have a, we argued the Doe versus Cisco case um, a couple of weeks ago in the Court of Appeals in California uh, in the Ninth Circuit. And uh, I think we had a pretty good reception that, um, that Nestle versus Doe leaves open the possibility of alien tort statute claims based on aiding and abetting activities from U.S. soil by U.S. corporations. But I wouldn't exactly say that alien tort statute litigation against corporations is a growth industry. Um, I think that we're hanging on by our, by our fingernails. There may be some scope for future cases, um, but I think they're somewhat limited. And I think we're looking to other possibilities. Uh, for example, um, in one of the cases, Doe versus Chiquita, which has to do with um, Chiquita's alleged complicity in mass murder in Colombia, um, we have brought claims against the individual um, corporate officials under the Torture Victim Protection Act, which doesn't apply to corporations, but does apply to individuals. And so that's now pending in the Court of Appeals in Atlanta. Um, and in addition, in that case, we have brought claims based on Colombian law. After the alien tort statute claims were dismissed, the case allowed us, the, the courts allowed us to proceed against Chiquita based on violation of Colombian law. And in Doe versus Exxon, which has to do with human rights violations in Aceh, Indonesia, um, the DC circuit courts have allowed us to um, continue with claims based on Indonesian law. So those are two cases that are moving towards trial and that may wind up being um, a more effective model, either bringing the cases in federal court based on diversity jurisdiction against US corporations um, for what they have done to foreign claimants, um, which in a sense, Richard, goes back to the model that Lee Day um, pioneered in, in, in British courts. So we may be reverting back to the mother country in, um, in doing this uh, kind of work. Um, and both of those cases seem to be on the way towards trial. In particular, the Exxon case looks like it's going to go to trial at some point in the middle of next year. And I think there's a sense that um, some of these cases can be brought in state courts, because as you know, in the US, we have a federal system, which is where the alien tort statute cases have always been. And we have an increasingly conservative Supreme Court and federal judiciary. Um, but in a number of the states, the, there's, a, there's a movement in the other direction. For example, the California Supreme Court has now become a liberal Supreme Court where it has been a pretty conservative court for many years. Um, and in a number of other blue states like Illinois and New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, where a lot of these corporations um, are doing most of their business, um, we may be able to use state courts to bring tort claims or claims based on foreign law because it's ha it, it has been a longstanding tradition in US courts that you can bring transitory tort actions against tort feasors wherever you find them. Uh, another gift from from the English legal system that we got at our founding. Um, so those are the things that we're looking at. And in some particular areas, 
like trafficking, forced labor, supply chain violations that involve those things, we have started to bring claims based on the Trafficking Victim Protection Reorganization Act, the TVPRA, uh, which is an explicit statutory cause of action for when corporations knowingly benefit from forced labor and slavery in their supply chain. And there have been cases brought based on Thai shrimp, based on cobalt mined in the DRC, based on co against the cocoa companies um, for child slave labor in West Africa. Um, and we're waiting on a number of decisions, both, to, both at the district court level and court of appeals level, to see whether the courts will allow the TVPRA to be used to police human rights violations and supply chains. And I think that's going to be an area where there'll be a substantial amount of litigation um, in the next few years. I think you, in a way, Paul, already answered my next question about whether we'll see images of conventional tort claims and development of UWK jurisprudence in the US in a similar way as in Canada, Netherlands, or UK. If you have anything to add, please do. Yeah, I think that that's going to be one of the areas where, um, where there will be a lot of action. And, you know, the, the, the main theme, I think, of my answer is that um, there's a tremendous corporate accountability movement around the world and in the United States. And, and I think that has been assisted by the corporate cases under the Alien Tort Statute over the years. Um, that movement's not going away. It's only getting stronger. And so even if the Supreme Court limits the alien tort statute, um, there are still other avenues and, and whatever avenues work is what litigators are gonna use. Um, and I think that the inter international human rights and um, the guiding principles and other international materials will inform the state tort cases uh, in a variety of ways whether it's defeating forum non-convenience motions or, or the definition of tort claims. In foreign law, there are often foreign jurisdictions that incorporate international human rights law. And so we have brought some claims, for example, in a case, in, a trafficking case in Texas that I'm working on, we based part of the claims on Iraqi law, which incorporates international law. And so we may get an alien tort statute type claim but base it on Iraqi law. So we're all learning other legal systems. And, and the other thing I'd say generally is that when we started out and you know, we started litigating alien tort statute claims 41 years ago in 1980. Um, and when we'd get up in front of judges, they would say, well, why should we do this? We're the only ones, nobody else does this. You know, we don't wanna be isolated. And one thing that you can't say that anymore, right? Look at all the people on this call and the, the, the information in the book and Nevsum and all the cases around the world, Lafarge. Um, you can get up in front of a US court now and say, look, we're, if anything, we're behind the curve now. Um, and so you're not isolated if you reach out and hold corporations accountable. And you know, those are the arguments we're gonna be making. And, Hopefully, you know, we're still in the baby years, right? We're only 41 years old or 25 years old. That's where, you know, we need to get to middle age and build a bit of a more sturdy foundation. <laughs> well, I guess one of the one of the, the, the difficulties though with the conventional tour group for, for you in the US is the, the antagonism that uh, American courts have towards foreign claimants and the very strict uh, application of forum non-convenience that we saw, for instance, in the Bhopal litigation many years ago, and um, also many years ago, although the case is still going on in the Chevron Ecuador litigation. I mean, that's quite a big challenge, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there are those challenges, but take a look at Doe versus Chiquita. We have claims for nearly 8,000 claimants from Colombia for mass murder or Exxon, you know, the, the, there are cases out there and, and they were based on very traditional doctrine. And I, I can say that I argued a case in the 11th circuit a month ago in Chiquita, where we had a very conservative panel and they were terrific. And absolutely no question about the fact that it was okay for 8,000 Colombian claimants to be in front of federal courts in Florida. 
Um, so, you know, I, I think you can take the Chevron case and and the um, the Bhopal case, and I don't think that those are reflective of the general reception in U.S. courts to claims based on transitory torts, particularly against U.S. corporations. Thank you very much, Paul. And it, since we are talking about forum non-convenience, I would like to ask Dan about the future of litigation in the UK courts in light of Brexit and the fact that there is no sign that um, UK will join the Lugano Convention. It's not part of the Brussels framework anymore. And so the forum non-convenience analysis is back on the table. Do you think that it will be the setback for the claimants? Um, thank you, Katia. Uh, I think it will be um, a setback, but it's it's nothing we can't deal with. Um, I, I mean, I think I just I just like, also like to say that I'm very inspired by what I've heard tonight so far. Uh, it just shows you how much we have come um, in the last few years, uh, how much has been achieved in so many different jurisdictions. And hearing Paul, who started this work 41 years ago, and now all the successes you're seeing in France and Canada and Germany and the UK. I mean, it's just remarkable what's been achieved. It's slow progress, but boy, what we're trying to do is huge. And we're succeeding, I think, fundamentally. Um, but look, back to Forum on Convenience. Um, yes, look, it feels like we've, over the last five years, we've climbed the mountain of parent company liability only to find that a brick wall has been constructed at the top of the mountain. We've got a get over that as well. Uh, I mean, the problem with forum on convenience is it means that it's open to multinationals to argue that remedy is available locally, um, entirely disingenuously in most circumstances, they would be arguing that. Uh, they know full well the remedy is not available. That's why the case has been brought to London. Uh, and that's why we're doing it. If you can get justice locally, why not do it locally? And that means the jurisdiction challenge can be strung out. And as Richard said in his KPLC, his Lubain KPLC case uh, years ago, it took uh, several years for the forum issues to be litigated and a thousand people, a thousand claimants died during that process. Now, the reason I'm not excessively um, pessimistic about this is because uh, on every forum argument we've had in court, we have prevailed, we have succeeded. We've got cases from South Africa, India, Zambia, Kenya, uh, and we have won all of them on forum arguments. And I think we will continue to do so. Um, but it does mean the cases will take longer, whereas the battleground of the last few years has been around the scope of parent company liability, uh, now the battleground will probably move on to forum on convenience, but I think we will, as I say, prevail. It will just take a little longer for us to do so. I should also say, I don't think it's out of the question that we will eventually join Lugano. I think um, at the moment, the relations between the EU and the UK are poor, but I think they may well, uh, if they improve or settle down, or potentially if there's a change of government in a couple of years, who knows what could happen. Um, so I don't think it's out of the question that we'll be back to mandatory jurisdiction in the medium term. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, now, uh, um, as Katia mentioned at the beginning, uh, Peter Cashman, who wrote the chapter on the Australian position, was, was unable to join us today. But we do have Susan Dunn from Harbour Litigation Funding, who is, she's the director of, of Harbour Litigation. She's written a chapter in the book. And um, of course, Susan, you, um, Harbour, funded the recent Montara case that was so successful in the Australian Federal Court earlier this year, the case for the Indonesian seaweed farmers that was brought as a, as a class action. Uh, and um, so you're funding that case. Uh, Augusta litigation is funding our case involving 
uh, lead poisoning at the Cadway mine in Zambia. That's the case in, in the South Africa court. So it looks as though litigation funders are showing an increasing interest in funding this type of work. Um, now, I mean, obviously litigation funders are primarily commercial organizations who are looking for a return on investment. Uh, how do you see the, the, these types of cases? Do you think that they have a lot of potential and what kind of considerations do you make as a litigation funder in deciding what types of cases you're willing to fund? Well, well, thank you, Richard. And I should also acknowledge that this was a chapter which I wrote with my colleague, Felix Curtis, who at the time was our trainee solicitor. We're the only funder who has a training contract for solicitors and has since qualified. So great thanks to him for uh, us working on this together. And I mean, you know, it's interesting. And I know it's not quite the same. Yesterday was a day of two halves for Google in that uh, they successfully avoided a claim for breach of privacy rights in, in the morning and in the afternoon had upheld the uh, in excess of 2 billion euro fine for anti-competitive behavior by uh, them in, the, in the relation to where they position their comp competitors on the shopping front. Uh, both of those cases are funded, uh, not the, obviously the regulatory side, but there are civil claims that follow on from that. And, and in both those cases, as with the Indonesian seaweed farmers um, and as with the cabway cases, these cases simply cannot proceed unless funding is available because there's only so far that, that law firms uh, like Lee Day and others can go in terms of bearing the millions of pounds that these cases cost because we often see what tactics the defendants in these cases take and the, the adverse costs exposure or the disbursements have to be paid. So funding um, is providing a role there, but it's one of those great uh, combinations where it's a sort of a win-win. Yes, we love it when we can fund these types of cases. They, they, you know, you, you should love all your cases that you fund equally, but you do tend to love these types of cases more because there's a sort of additional benefit that comes from the funding succeeding. And, and I'm pleased to report that in a, it reported that the Montara fishermen succeeded on liability by the time the book was published. And uh, since then, we've just had the common issues judgment uh, handed down and in relation to the prospect for damages then the judge has made clear that the, the group is um, the, the potential group of those who will benefit is, is as wide as we could have possibly hoped for but that was a classic case of showing a defendant who did and continues to do everything to make life as difficult as possible in that case. And it's incredibly expensive to bring these claims. But the, the same things apply to these types of cases as they do to every other case that we fund. And, and, and Richard, you'll know we're funding with your firm domestic cases, equal pay claims, zero hours contract type claims. All of these are, are what I would put in the, in the human rights category um, of people who on their own can't afford, because the claims aren't big enough on their own to bring them. But it's always the same things that we look for. Have we got a defendant that can pay? And that's, that's a very important piece because you can sort of think, oh, who am I actually suing in this case? Is it the parent company? And we've talked about the data, et cetera. Or is it domestic company only? What will the parent do to come in to cover any um, award if that's made? Having to be certain that you can get paid. Understanding what the basis for the value of the claim is, that's really important. What, what are, why are we assuming, and the, and the Google case yesterday was essentially saying they thought that the, the claim values were not there amongst other things, really important, because we have to then look at, well, how much funding is required? And if I look at the Montara case, I don't have the exact uh, cost to date, but I think we're well in excess of 15 million pounds that that case has cost on own side costs alone so far. I mean, that's just a, a, a sum of money that nobody can contemplate without funding being there. And then, and then it's the legal merits. I mean, we talk about these, these litigations and they're invariably large groups and people sort of distinguish between class actions, group actions and individual claims. But I've always said that group actions for the most part are really just a legal claim that happen to have 
a large number of claimants attached to them. But the, the reason that the, the group is relevant is that you need to then look at what the potential universe of claimants is. You have to then figure out, depending on which jurisdiction you're in, whether you've got an opt-in or an opt-out system, and clearly if it's an opt-in, realistically how many claimants can be signed up because that gives you the sense of what the aggregate claim value might be and as a general rule of thumb if anybody comes to us and says we're going to be able to sign up 100 percent of these this group um, unless there are good reasons to show that's what the case is we tend to assume you won't do better than 50 percent of a sign up so do the numbers work on that base basis and then Assuming that those numbers look good, it's then about the legal merits of the case. So you kind of funders take a look at these things from the economic side of things and then look at the legal merits of the case, not the other way around, because it doesn't matter how great your case is if you can't see how you're going to get paid and if you can't see that the value is there in the claim. So it's a very consistent approach that we take. But yes, I mean, undoubtedly, we these types of claims where we can make them work economically. And, and there are, you know, when we've seen the evolution of the types of cases, and I think looking at potentially what are the sort of climate uh, type cases that we might be bringing, new areas unfold all the time. And we're very fortunate, most of our, most of our investors are, are, are educational endowments, that's whose money we look after, who are thrilled that we're able to do cases like this whenever we're able to do so. So huge enthusiasm from those whose money we look after and a lovely broad mandate for us to consider really almost any type of case you can think of as long as those factors stack up. Uh, thanks very much, Susan. I can I can certainly um, agree that um, lit litigation funding is it, it's a very important tool in uh, access to justice, especially in the, in the in the very very big cases. Um, so you know it, it's 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 um, it's a welcome development that funders are showing an interest in this area. If I can just um, move on to Miriam, uh, who I think has joined us, um, joined us now. Miriam, um, Miriam Sargamas from, from Germany. Miriam, uh, in Germany, you've had the, the kick case, of course, which was uh, concerned that the factory in Pakistan that burned down. And again, uh, as with Hannah in the Netherlands, you were looking at the case brought under English law there, which um, I know was, was uh, unsuccessful on, on limitation grounds. But there's also been an interesting climate change case against the German parent company R RWE, brought by a Peruvian farmer. I mean, perhaps you could tell us a bit about, about that case. Yes, um, so the Peruvian case, um, it is applying German tort law because of the Rome 2 regulation, which um, provides for um, an option to choose for the claimants in cases of environmental damages. And what it actually it does, it is bringing, um, it's a precautionary um, uh, uh, claim, uh, saying that there is damage to be expected on the property of the Peruvian farmer once the glacier uh, that is above um, his property will be will have will have made melted and it's likely that then his his land will be flooded and so we are already asking or we are asking uh, or the claimants are asking rwe to pay for the necessary um sort of precautionary measures so that floodings in the future will be avoided um, the case is now um, is in um, in the trial phase, um, but it has not like the trial proceedings have not opened yet. So they are in the phase of um, um, evidence taking. Um, so so we don't uh, quite know yet where that will go. What is encouraging is that the appeals court, um, the the in the first instance, the court dismissed the case, and the appeals court um, uh, said that. On, in principle, uh, this claim is governed by tort under German law. And so in principle also, it is possible that there is a liability of the company. So it's, uh, it's, they said it's merely a question of whether the causality um, uh, can be proven. So emissions um, uh, that, that RW East, um, CO2 emissions that RW is responsible for, um, and whether it's it's provable that those emissions 
are um, have um, are causal for the potential harm that this um, farmer is fearing, and we need to see where that where that comes, uh, yeah, where what the outcome will be. Well, it's, a, it's an inter interesting case, but the, the number of cases in Germany has been quite limited. I mean, are there features? Uh, I, I know the answer because I've read your chapter, of course, but. Uh, that there are features, aren't there, of the German legal system that make it perhaps less conducive uh, to this type of litigation around disclosure of documents and collective actions and legal costs and so on. Perhaps you could just um, summarise how you see those things. Yes. So, um, you know, as we've been speaking before, I think so. if you look into substantial law, um, German tort law is uh, is sort of a pretty normal normal um, uh, civil law tort jurisdiction with with its advantages and disadvantages. So I don't think that on the plus, if we take into account the you know the general principle of Rome two, it will usually always be foreign law to be applicable with um, you know with all the challenges, but also the potentials it has if we start using the UK uh, jurisprudence. I think also the the K case would look at today differently now after we have the Vedanta decision and Okpapi. But anyways, so I don't think that the problem necessarily is that we only have very few cases, two, I would say, the two I'm, I'm referring to in my article. Um, so it's not necessarily, it's not the substantial law. It is more that um, the civil law jurisdiction that Germany is, is absolutely not favorable for, for tort litigation because of uh, one, it is a, prob um, a very restrictive discovery rules. Um, we do not have pre-trial discovery whatsoever. And then once you are in trial, so what you so the claimants need to substantiate all the all the aspects of their claim when they file the claim, and then when it comes to trial, also there the discovery that can be expected of the defendant is rather limited. Um, so that is uh, that is definitely a hurdle, um, but I don't think that this is the most uh, problematic part of it. Because, you know, as you can see, obviously, we have a tort law system that also somehow works. So judges know also a bit how to work their um, way around. There are ways to ease the burden of proof and, you know, to, you know, partially reverse this and so on. So I even think, well, that is challenging, you know, but it can be overcome. But what makes litigation definitely absolutely not favorable for law firms and makes them absolutely dependent on um, extra funding is that uh, we have a very restricted cost regime and um, um, which is governed by law, by statutory law. And that, and we do not have um, any, so that may, means that costs can hardly be recovered uh, from the, uh, even if you're winning the case. So the only costs that can be recovered are, are the, the lawyer's fees um, that have been incurred, but only according to statutory law. And that is, again, not what a lawyer can ever live on in, if he or she is working on such a large big case. Um, extra judicial um, uh, costs are not recoverable. And then in addition to that, um, we need to, we need to um, see that we do not have a contingency. There's no basis for contingency fee agreements. It's, it's basically not, uh, it's, it's more or less illegal. And then in addition to that is that we have a very restrictive um, way that um, of, um, of uh, the compensation that is being paid because it's really strictly compensation for the, for the loss that has occurred. So we do not have punitive damages. Um, so, so that means, again, even if you win, you will only gain a very limited amount of money which may be quite satisfactory for, for claimants that have actually have a material loss. But again, it's never something that will ever pay the real costs of the litigation. Thank you very much, Miriam. And thanks for all the great work that you and your colleagues are doing. Uh, I'm conscious about the time, but we are going to ask you more questions. And I would like to bring Jason now um, here and ask him a few questions. So, Jason, you will face a quite um, challenging question. Um, human rights litigation quite often is discussed in the context of judicial imperialism and sovereignty issues. And you're South African. If you uh, 
um, pioneer cases that we have already discussed um, in the UK were brought by South African claimants. How can we ensure the balance between facilitating access to justice for victims, avoiding jurisdictional conflicts, and then contributing at the same time to the development of local remedies? Thanks, Katya. Uh, that's a, a really important debate in the field. And I first want to say I'm sorry that I'm sitting in the dark. Um, it's not intended to be one of the wolves in a cave that Ray Lindsay was uh, anxious might be waiting to, to jump out at multinationals in this webinar. Um, it's the responsibility of our local energy parastatal because we're being load shed here in Johannesburg right now. Uh, so I'm doing this webinar by candlelight. Um, wow. <laughs> we admire your dedication, Jason. Thank you. But just to say that this is an important, judicial imperialism is an ongoing and important debate internationally. But from the South African perspective, I don't think it's been a major concern. Um, I think the starting priority is effective relief for claimants and victims. Um, and that paradigm of international human rights law that Anita and Robert and others painted earlier places a duty to protect on, uh, on home states um, that requires them to regulate their multinationals and to provide effective remedies for the harm that they do around the world. Um, so that would be, I think, our starting perspective as human rights lawyers in South Africa. But this is not a matter of judicial imperialism when these case cases are decided, perhaps in the UK, but rather a matter of judicial accountability for economic neo-imperialism on the part of multinationals. Um, and I would also add that I think as the chapter by um, Zanelli and I shows, um, the, the cases being decided in the UK haven't slowed the development of South African law. Uh, it's continued to develop and South Africa is a site for litigation itself. And to pick up uh, on this specifically, can you outline um, the key features of the South African system that make it a favorable, favorable forum for litigants? Sure, I think you know that we touch on these in the chapter, and um, it is a favorable um, in litigation environment, I would say. Um, and importantly, it's a dual context because South Africa is both a home and a host state. So the Kabwe case that was mentioned earlier um, uh, regarding harm in Zambia is being litigated in South Africa. Um, there are a number of features, um, and they include institutional features, so strong independent courts, uh, a sophisticated legal profession with the capacity to, to do these cases, in particular, uh, a remarkable public interest sector, I think, in global comparative perspective, uh, including organizations such as the Legal Resources Center, which I worked for at the time, but about 10 other organizations um, that focus on doing public interest pro bono work of this sort in South Africa. Um, also, a number of aspects of the law, so a range of the procedural aspects the people like Miriam uh, before me were mentioning in South Africa are favorable. So whether it's standing costs, expansive remedies, um, a flexible test for causation, um, all of those are favorable. Um, and so too the substantive law. Um, and there I would particularly single out the constitution. So uh, I think South Africa in contrast, it stands in contrast to all of the other jurisdictions in this book for having an expansive, generous, far-reaching constitution uh, with a Bill of Rights that applies horizontally, so imposes obligations on private actors, including companies, um, and a constitution that has a historic perspective. It's concerned with historic injustice, concerned with social justice, concerned with redistribution, um, and where the legal culture invites cases of this sort. That, that provide accountability for historic injustice. Um, so for example, uh, uh, silicosis litigation, uh, applying various different procedural routes, but all concerned with um, this, this history of almost a century of um, negligence in the South African gold mines. Um, and the courts were responsive, the profession is responsive. Um, so uh, overall, the environment is, is, um, is a, is a conducive one um, to litigation against multinationals. Thanks very much, Jason. Looks like your lights have come back on. Zanella, you don't seem to be in the dark and you're in Johannesburg as well. You haven't been load shedded. 
Actually, uh, just before the, the webinar started, um, my schedule ended uh, and I guess Jason just started. Mine was, yeah, so I was keeping my fingers crossed that they will they'll come back because sometimes it takes longer for them to come back. Good, well, thank you. Thanks for, for joining us and thanks uh, to you and Jason for your, your great chapter, uh, which, is, um, which is really important. Um, contribution to the book. Now, I mean, we've worked together for, for 20 years now, first on the Cape PLC case, which was litigated in the UK, and then subsequently for many, many years on the silicosis litigation, in which Jason was also involved at some stage with the, the Legal Resources Centre, and now more recently on the class action, in which has been also run in the South African courts for the Cabway lead poisoning victims. Do you feel that this type of cross border collaboration between lawyers works? And the answer to that is, is yes, obviously. But I mean, do you think it, <laughs> do you think it, do you think it works? And, and, and could it be used uh, more widely, in your view, to, to facilitate access to justice for victims in local courts using the local courts? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, congratulations on the book. Um, and to everyone who has contributed. Um, yes, obviously, besides the fact that I am biased, that it works, it does work uh, precisely for access to justice. And in our particular collaboration, the development of this type of litigation, class sections in South Africa. And you can, all, you can almost chart our, the development on class actions with our own collaboration. Because as you mentioned, when we did CAPE, we couldn't do CAPE in South Africa at the time. And that's why it went to the UK. But if you recall, when we were starting the silicosis case, we had a whole discussion about would it be justifiable for us to actually issue this case in the UK? And we actually said no, because South African jurisdiction, um, I mean, South African courts had, a uh, sorry, class actions had developed somewhat in South African courts and the you know contingency fees are allowed and all those uh, um, favorable things that Jason just mentioned right now and we also thought that it, it just made sense for those cases to be issued in South Africa and from then onwards we started the, with the 20 precedent stain cases to test the waters and then you know there's been progress and up to now with the Cabo case and the Cabo case in itself has got such implication uh, amazing implications amazing for us Claimant lawyers in that if you're a South African uh, multinational company that has caused has caused damage, the consequence of the cover case is that, and you can be the case can be brought in in South Africa. So in that sense, yes, it's a good collaboration. There is also the issue of the costs of these cases. These cases take a long time. They take incredible amount of resources that claimant lawyers always never have and rely on litigation funders now, which is a good thing. And it's a good thing that in South Africa litigation funding is allowed. So now this collaboration in terms of financial resources, human resources is a huge thing because a small firm like mine, even though we've been together for 20, or nearly 20 years, um, is able to do these cases because I have the support from a big law firm like you guys who has been doing these cases for a long time. Thanks very much, Nell. And the Cumber case sounds devastating, and generations, generations of children have been suffering. Do you think that such type of abuse will be tolerated in the global north? And also, Anglo-American is very clear about its human rights commitments, but would you say that there are grounds on which it has challenged the class action sit comfortably with its public commitments? Okay, so let me start um, maybe with the second question first. Um, I think Anglo's pronouncements about uh, their commitment to business and human rights, as well as even they've gone further to say that they are, they've, they're acknowledging their role that they've played in the past is lip service. None of any, every time they mention any of that and they say they take accountability, they've never done or, or made any action to show that they're serious about this evidenced by the fact of how hard they fight these cases, right? Silicosis cases took forever, right? Anglo was the biggest mining company in the Southern Africa. 
And not only was it big, it had huge political influence. For them to fight these cases as hard as they're fighting them and not even properly acknowledging their role in how black people were treated in South, in South Africa and in Southern Africa is actually an equivalent to ghosting those victims. And it is quite despicable. I feel that they are, they do get away with their pronouncement because nobody is actually challenging them properly to say, well, what are you doing? What is happening in Kabwe right now and has been happening for the past 50 years is short of, it's horrific. And they would never let that happen in Europe and in certain parts of America where a large population of large towns that they're in are not populated by black people. It is quite interesting that what has happened in Flint and what is happening in Cowboy is that the one common fact, other than the fact of lead poisoning, is that it's predominantly black and poor people who are suffering the most. Anglo needs to acknowledge its past and it needs to acknowledge its past in a real sense and not just pay lip service. And I think they're not taken to task enough about this. So it's left to the lawyers. And that's how the victims, or well, I don't want to say the victims, actually, the claimants come to lawyers because nobody goes to a lawyer the first time around. They try and try and try to find a solution. They come to us as the last resort because they seek this justice and because they've been going on and telling people what has been going on and no one was listening. Um, just uh, and obviously your, your reference to Flint was to the case which has been going on in Michigan where thousands yes. of people have just um, received a, the benefit of a, a massive settlement. Uh, in, in yes, for lead poisoning, yeah. For lead poisoning at, uh, at levels which are much, much lower than the children. Of totally. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the levels are 10 times higher in Cowboy. Uh, than in, um, in in Flint, Michigan. But yet, Anglo's response to our papers has been hundreds and hundreds of documents challenging, and it's a proper fight. So they are bringing out the guns. So again, it's only lip service them saying that they know what their role was in the past and they're committed to doing the right thing. They're not. Thanks very much, Zanane. And uh, look, I'm sure that there are people who are involved in this panel today and um, who are listening who would be interested in exploring the possibility of working with local lawyers in multinational host states to try and bring, bring cases in those, in those uh, local courts if that is possible. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to wind up now uh, we've run over time quite um, quite significantly already. There were lots of other questions that we wanted to ask, but we just don't have time. We'll we have just to have those. to convene another event. We'll, <laughs> we'll have to do another event. So um, well, just to wind up, uh, and I mean, I was just thinking, uh, remembering uh, a few years ago that I had a conversation with a commercial lawyer who explained to me that the reason his charging rate was double mine was quality. And I was thinking that maybe that's the reason why this book is so expensive. Um, but it could also be, I suppose, because they weren't expecting to sell many copies. I guess it's one of, one of those two. But, but look, seriously, um, I want to, want to thank all of the, uh, my co-contributors to the book for giving up their time today, but more importantly, for uh, all the time that they have spent writing uh, their chapters, which are, I think are, are excellent and provide really invaluable insights into this area of litigation in their own countries and the, the practical um, opportunities and challenges that, that they face in the countries in which they practice. So I, I'm really grateful to all of you and for your patience um, with, with, with me in, in um, kind of pestering you to produce your, your chapters. So um, you know, I hope that, that um, people who read this book will find it, uh, will find it worthwhile and, and enjoy um, and enjoy reading it. On behalf of Thank you, Richard, you know, for all your energy in making it happen, because without you, it wouldn't have happened. Well, thanks for that, Robert. Um, uh, 
Uh, on behalf of, of Lee Day, I, I want to thank um, Katia and Bonavira for all the time and energy that you've put into this. And for uh, we're, we're really delighted to, to host this with you uh, jointly. And uh, finally, to everyone who, who's, who's joined us today, uh, we, we hope you've found this discussion worthwhile. Uh, it's, we've overrun, but um, uh, hopefully that hasn't put you off too much. And that um, if you can afford it, yeah, you might enjoy reading the book. So thanks very much. Thank you, everyone.